we proceed with them, Anne will take maybe five minutes to respond to a, a few things, and then we'll open it up for questions. She can just say thank you. <laughs> I can say thank you. I'm happy to say thank you. Um, <coughs> I'll say thank you, thank you to Joan, and also I should say thank you also to Talal Assad, um, who I of course did have in mind when I was writing this, and and who spared me right talking about certain things um, by doing so himself, particularly state violence, which I don't talk mm -hmm. about very much, right. but he does, it, and really quite brilliantly. Um, that that question of state violence, I think, is is addressed in another way by Sheldon Rowland. When Wolin talks about, this is a really old article, and you probably don't know it, because especially people like, you know, you people over there who are, like, really young. Um, <laughs> but this was written in 1967, and it was published in a really obscure, or seemingly really obscure journal called the Journal of Orthopsychiatry. Wow. So you wouldn't come across it accidentally. But um, in this, Wolin makes this really brilliant observation about us, um, us moderns, us late moderns. And he says... We have this paradoxical relation to violence. On the one hand, we have this enormous capacity to do violence. We can, we can just, we can, we have all these weapons of mass destruction, as they're now called. He says, but we have this incredible sensitivity to it as well. So that any tiny little thing, any little attack, becomes the occasion for unleashing this enormous violence. And that observation, I think, is really, is, it's important to remember in, in light of the way that we talk about terrorism because it is, both, it is that response of little tiny violence met by vast response. And that the, the sort of asymmetries of that response from, from the state, I think, are worth taking notice of as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so having, having at least paid some of my debts, uh, maybe we should just open it up. Is that good? Sure, sure. Uh, and we're, since we are trying to take this, we'd love it if you could um, use the uh, microphone or, or, they want, or, or walk around to either mic. That would like Come around? Yeah, if you can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, my name is Jill Norgren, and I've done uh, a great deal of work on cultural pluralism in law. And I, I wondered, Professor Norton, um, if you would speak in terms of the United States um, about state institutional reactions to Native Americans and to Japanese Americans in particular as precursors of both um, – the responses that were – not both – the responses that we are seeing in the United States uh, today, both from government, from media, uh, and from the academy. Uh, the, the first um, – right after 9-11, my father called me, and my father is an old military – he's a veteran of three wars. Um, and he said something that very much surprised me. He said, I hope that they don't lock the Muslims up. I remember when they locked up the Japanese. Now, my father is not a leftist. Um, my father is a sort of Midwestern kind of moderate Republican. And also, I didn't know that someone who grew up on a farm in Illinois would have had any sense of what had happened to the Japanese. But it, it was lodged for him as a, as a traumatic memory, and also as a shame. Um, that, and that also, I also noticed that in the Seattle market when I went to the APSA in Seattle. And in the market, in this big touristic thing over the place where they throw the fish, is a series of... Um, of representations of Japanese life in the market and the observation that there used to be many Japanese Americans in the market and now there were essentially none. And that, on the one hand, there is this constant play in American life of performing acts of horrific violence and remembering them with shame and grief later. And that... 
the shame and grief never make up for the wrong done. And this is, of course, most visible with regard to Native Americans, where the erasure is very great. And I think what I would like, I would like to see us short circuit that um, that tendency to move collective violence, and, and not just the violence of the state, but the violence of things like the Klan, to sort of license or enable these and then to regret them later. I think we, we, with many of these things, we know in advance that what we do is wrong and that somehow escaping that cycle of, of immediate or immediate action and then regret would be very important. And that is, I mean, that, that's an answer kind of off kilter to your question. Um, but it is what, what strikes me most about those two events, that, there is, that somehow the regret is meant, meant to be compensatory, but it can, never, it can never make up for that. And I think there is, well, there's, not, there's already been a great deal of state violence. Um, at, the risk, at the risk of being too diffuse, let me say one more thing about that. And um, this is something quite disturbing, I think, about the way in which the United States has, um, has reacted to its perception of Muslims as a threat. And I think it, there, we have not done that. That is to say, we have not interned Muslims in the United States, with some non-trivial exceptions. I mean, there are people who have been deported and people who have been detained and some very um, unjust and shameful things that have been done. But we haven't produced big camps, and some of those were called for. But we have projected the violence outward. So instead of internment camps, we have wars. And that, that, is, that is also disturbing. And I don't know quite what to make of that. I, I, I merely observe it, that we seem to have, um, we, well, it, it might be admirable that we didn't intern large numbers of people as we did with Japanese Americans. We have projected much greater violence outward. And I don't know how great a cause for anxiety that should be. Okay, Carol next. And then whoever is dinging, maybe we could... Um no. Well, I think she's put her phone away. Now. Okay, all right, good. I well, but we have a mic. I have, and it will go around after I'm done. Um, okay, I have a question for each of you. Um, try to make it very brief, though. Um, wonderful presentations and very stimulating, but a sort of counterpoint question. Um, one reading of what you were saying, and might be that to the degree that one wants to see. The, any kind of terrorism as um, by analogy to uh, potentially revolutionary activists in some sense, it would seem to have the unfortunate consequence of making the difference between terrorism and uh, the campaigners in Tahrir Square for democracy as merely differing in tactics, as it were. And I, in the sense that one is using violent means and the other, um, although they're using violence in a certain way, um, are uh, using it certainly against, um, with the aim anyway, and to some degree the means of, um, of more, uh, uh, both creating democracy and interacting among themselves at least in more democratic or peace-loving ways. So... I do, do you accept that uh, conclusion, or am I hearing it wrong about the analogy to, say, suffragettes and, and so forth? Um, one wants to make a distinction between those campaigning for and, to some degree, institutionalizing among themselves democratic m- modes. Al Hebri last week, argue, last time rather, uh, who started off our session, argued that there are roots for democracy within Islamic thought, which she thought were quite profound and uh, rather, I thought she gave a very convincing um, account of that um, as one possibility, uh, but not obviously the only one because it can be read in other ways. So I'm just a little bit concerned with too easy an assimilation or how you would make a distinction. 
And the question um, to Joan, which I guess is also in a way, uh, this is briefer. I agree completely um, with the importance of uh, what I would just call self-criticism or whatever with, with respect to empathy, uh, the role of the importance of empathy uh, with everyone, including terrorists, in terms of not a kind of uh, just a feminine, feminine kind of empathy, but, you know, rigorous uh, or feminine in a better sense of uh, really understanding the situation of the other, the oppressive conditions, as well as understanding the other's point of view. But, but isn't it the case that, I mean, can't one also say that those, that some terrorists lack empathy towards their targets and cr be willing to criticize them for that very same lack? Um, I, I'm primarily interested not in the terrorists themselves, but in how how we react to them. Um, but having said that, but I think I I mean it's a legitimate question because I do cite that that question of our own origins in political violence and how we should judge them. Now I'm not a particular fan of Cromwell. He's not a historical figure that I am especially attracted to. But at the same time. I recognize that I owe Cromwell. I recognize the importance of Cromwell. And even perhaps the sense that I might, although there would be many things I would deprecate in Cromwell, I might owe him a debt, if only for saying, I'll cut off his head with the crown on it. Um, that that capacity to do totally disown monarchy might be an admirable one. And in the same way, I might, um, and indeed I, I am, I might be... I might admire um, someone like Franz Fanon who wrote about it more than someone who actually threw the bomb in the FLN. Um, but nevertheless, I am, I think, obliged to recognize the contribution of those, even though it is not the position I would choose. And I do think there's a radical difference between the people in Tahrir Square even the people who are pushing back the tanks on the Qasr al Aini bridge and, um, and terrorists. Indeed, some terrorists, some terrorists aren't Democrats at all. And I'm not interested in I mean, I'm not, I have no, no admiration for them any more than I do for Cromwell, who is, after all, no Democrat. Um, so it's not that I want to erase those distinctions. It's rather that I want to examine what our response to terror says about our own fears and anxieties, and particularly the way in which it becomes an obstacle to democracy here, and to democracy elsewhere, but quite frankly, primarily here. That it is, it is, it becomes an excuse for us to do and perpetuate undemocratic institutions and practices. I think I, she asked me a question yes, too. She did. I didn't, I didn't think I was calling for empathy with the terrorists um, at all. I don't think there's anywhere in my talk where I say that they live in such terrible conditions that we have to understand their work. Well, but I didn't say that. What I, what I thought I was doing was drawing a parallel between state violence, which goes beyond the conventions of acceptable warfare, and terrorism, which is thought to be totally different from that. And it, it seems to me it's that logic that one needs to, to call into question. Of course... Terrorists lack empathy for some terrorists lack empathy for their targets, but um, state violence, drone strikes, targeted assassinations, Israeli high school students beating up Arabs and saying they wish they killed them. I mean, it seems to me all of that um, is also demonstration of a lack of, of an othering of one's enemy. Um, but it doesn't get called terrorism; it gets called other things. Um, and and so the the question for me really is is in the use of the word itself, what counts? as terrorism, um, how are the lines drawn so that um, violations of the conventions of warfare don't count as terrorism um, and other kinds of actions do count as terrorism. But empathy was not really uh, – it, it was a kind of logic of, of, of warfare and a definition of what counts as terrorism that I was interested in, in talking about, not really the empathy or not with, with the enemy or with the targets. Um. Well, actually, we'll go around the room. I think that well, Shayla has the next question. And then um, I have, uh, yeah, Shayla Benabib. I have three points. The first uh, pursues Carol's um, 
uh, concerns. I mean, there is a literature that significantly distinguishes between terrorism and revolutionary violence, and much of the 19th and 20th century, you know, movements that we are familiar with have tried to make that distinction. And, you know, some criteria are revolutionary violence mobilizes the masses, there are selected public uh, targets. A violence is, you know, even as there is just a means, it is not anonymous. It does not aim to spread fear. There is a message that is conveyable, uh, you know, and you try to destroy buildings, inanimate objects. I mean, these are all part of the canon of reflection in, you know, political thought about these distinctions. And I would say that it doesn't seem to me to be helpful, honestly, at the time when the subjects of terror attacks are the people in the Muslim countries themselves. Okay, every other day, somebody is blown up in Iraq. It is not happening here. It is not happening in Paris. It is not happening in London. It may. You are right that we are, you know, afraid of it. And I find, you know, your critique, your psychoanalytical critique of the anxieties of late democracy quite appropriate. But the real uh, uh, targets of terrorism today in Muslim countries are Muslims themselves. So we might ask ourselves then the question whether as critical theorists, we do not also have an obligation to try to make the relevant distinctions between Salafists on the one hand, Muslim brothers on the other hand, remnants of you know, Al-Qaeda or the offshoots of liberal democracy, uh, aspiring nonviolent movements even in the Arab world. I mean, we could have a longer conversation about this, but I think the Palestinian resistance movement has changed its tactics. And since it has done that, you know, there are really different offshoots of what might be happening there. I mean, there's, my last point is that there's a very honorable tradition of mass democratic movements of nonviolence in the 20th and the 21st century. So I want to tread carefully here. I mean, if the issue is a critique of ourselves, fine. If the issue is a larger reflection on revolutionary violence or trying to engage with the politics of contemporary Islamic resistance movements, not jihad. Jihad is one variety of Islamic resistance among others. Then I think we need to make more distinctions. I mean, I really enjoyed both of your presentations, you know. Yes. Um, in that case, I think I'm in the clear <laughs> um, because I do, in fact, not want to talk about it. I, and I don't talk about Islamic resistance movements. I have, back in the day, a long time ago, I did talk about terror, and I was very interested in drawing in, I guess it was my second book, in drawing the distinctions that you mentioned between terror and revolutionary violence or um, mass terror, state terror, you know, that, that, as you quite correctly say, that vast literature about those distinctions, which I agree is enormously important. And I don't take that up here because I am, um, I mean, it is, it's, it's just, it's another, it's another subject, and I agree it is a profoundly important one. I also agree with you about, I mean, I agree with you so, with you so much in this respect that it's not particularly interesting, um, th about the changing character of the Palestinian resistance movement and the wide range of Islamic resistance movements that are operative. And I do also agree with the point that much of that terror is directed at Muslim populations. Um, but my interest here is not that. As you say, I'm just interested in talking about our reaction to terrorism in the West and our use of the category, and no more. I mean, if I were talking about terrorism itself, then it would indeed take much more the, the form that you sketch out. Jim, do you have a few words? No. Yeah. All right, so we'll, um, I'll, then you were next, and then um, why don't you just state your name for, you know. Linda Alcoff. Yeah, so just a question for Anne, I think, although I would love it if Joan has any thoughts on it. Um, wonderful presentations. I think I had some similar questions as Carol and Shayla. I really like the way you're breaking down the distinctions and showing that historically there's a lot of connections, but then on the other side you worry about overplaying that. I mean, I really liked your presentation, but then toward the end of it, what I really was curious about is how... And I want to focus on your question that you want to focus on, which is 
the United States West sort of response. I understand that's your project. But how an invocation of what I heard is a certain kind of universalism and individualism would be the solution to the West othering practices that you outlined so well. That's because it seems to me that when we talk about how we, you know, live in a city and we're happy to live in this diversity and we feel comfortable in it and we feel okay with the people that we work with and interact with, those aren't true statements that everybody in the world could make. They're not statements that everybody in New York could make, right? <laughs> and it, it's, we're comfortable in New York to some extent because it's run by liberal Eurocentric leadership with certain values and rhetoric that we feel familiar with, right? Everybody doesn't have the same relationship to that leadership, right? So it, it, what I worry about is that what precisely we need to do in the West – to re-understand what's happening is to fill in the story of the narrative a little bit more fully rather than just saying, well, we're scared of other people and everybody's scared of other people. We're particularly scared of Muslims. And Islam is not the same as Christianity, which is not the same as Judaism, which is not the same as Hinduism, as Aziza Al-Habri, you know, talked about. So we, we, need, we need a larger narrative there about Western notions of vanguardism, white anxieties in the United States going on right now, and the responses to Muslims that are coming out of a very particular narrative and history of colonialism in this place, you know, rather than... And that's why I love the, the on the Jewish question, because, you know, what Marx is saying there is that um, we are not in the public domain as abstract individuals. We come there as workers and bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. as Jews and Gentiles. And that's the discourse that I think we need to have. So I just, maybe this is just a question of clarification. How are we going to solve this problem by, you know, by the, um, uh, what I took to be kind of a thin idea that we're all kind of afraid of the other sometimes? Well, and we are, and we aren't. And um, I think one of the ways that we solved one of my one of my arguments in this book, but let me expand it a little bit because I actually have this problem all the time um, when I'm when I'm teaching or when I'm even acting just sort of as a general like academic person. Um, what does it mean to say I'm a Westerner? I actually spent a significant part of my childhood in Southeast Asia. Um, I, um, the most important books to me growing up were Franz Fanon and W.E.B. Du Bois. And, um, you know, in my house, the music we play is um, Rai and other Maghrebi, North African music. Um, but that's... but. I'm not that. I'm, I'm somehow a Westerner. Now, that's, there's something profoundly wrong about that. And um, one, of the, one of the questions I have about this is, must I remember white? I mean, am I really a Eurocentric person? I learned to eat with chopsticks before I learned to eat with a fork. Um, I mean, yes, but, and yet I must be. That is what I'm called to be, and that is what I must be. So I think, I, I think there are several things that we need to do. One is we need to rethink the West because the West isn't very Western anymore. I mean, if I walk down my street in Philadelphia, I see not just one woman. I'm, I'm not just one woman in a hijab. I see a lot of women in all sorts of Islamic garb, and men too. You know, every, I see, I, there's, a, there's a woman who, who checks me out at the grocery who has the full niqab. I mean, she's just, and I see her all the time. Everybody sees her all the time. Nobody thinks anything of it. And that, you know, so are we Western? Are, what are we? We're not as Western as we think we are. And that's a really good thing. Because it wasn't so great being that Western. It's much more interesting now. And, um, and I think we have to be allowed to admit to our non-Westernness. Instead of saying, 
And if somebody says, for years, I mean, that's why I came up with this question, must I remember white? For years when people said, well, who are your intellectual influences? I would stop myself from saying Franz Fanon and Du Bois because it would appear to be, I thought, Man, I can't say that. I'm a white woman. But it's, that's really wrong. It's not paying the debt that is due to those men. And so we have to be able to remember what, where we really have our debt, what we really learn from, and to admit to a certain non, non-Westernness in ourselves, or to admit that the West is different. So that's one part, I think. The other part, I think, is this question of, of fear. Um, now, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a pedestrian thing to say, but I think it doesn't mean, need to be said. Who blows up people in the U.S.? Well, the people bomb abortion clinics. And, um, you know, there are, these, um, there are these young men with guns. I mean, in fact, the, close, the, person, the only person who I know personally, other than in a war, the only person I know personally who was killed by violence, not in a war, was killed on a military base by one of those insane shooters who gets a gun. And um, so we are familiar with mass killings done by, you know, Michigan militia types or people who are opposed to abortion. And yet we don't think, my God, it's another white guy with a gun. Um, but So I think we need to edit our... And it's good that we don't. I don't want us to do that. I don't want us to start looking at he might have a gun. <laughs> it would be, I would, I want us to be fearless the way we are with the people from the Michigan militia. I want us to be a little less fearful because I think that a lot depends on it. And I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying it's always going to be right because those people are there. But I think much depends upon assuming that posture of courage. Since, since we started late, I have a sense that maybe we could go to six. Uh, you know, the entire time, and is that okay? No, it's okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, Susan Buck-Morris, and I do want to say that uh, both talks were great, and it, it's, it's terrific that this kind of discussion is going on, and it's um, it has to be mentioned that it's women who are doing it more than people like Rawls, and that's also great. Uh, but I want to kind of criticize you. Uh, I want to criticize you from another perspective, um, and that is whether the whole, um, whether the fear, I mean, whether the whole uh, frame of identity is the one that's going to take us where we can most get over what all of us are not liking about the present situation. Um, and if we do go back to Linda's point about, um, you know, we come into the social sphere at a particular time in history, in a particular social uh, 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 situation, which is not an identity, it's a situation, then um, the issue might look different. And I want to suggest a possible difference, right, which is, uh, you know, to ask not what can we recognize in our own repressed past about the situation, the particular situation today, but what might be new? What about Islam might be new? new in the uh, global public sphere Mm -hmm. in a way that actually makes it more um, pertinent to a global identity, I didn't want to use that word, but a global uh, political um, um, discourse that has nothing to do with nation states and uh, does claim a kind of civil, it likes the word civilization, but if you look at what Al Ghazali says about civilization, uh, it's for him those various dynasties within the Muslim world, not Muslims versus somebody outside. What is it maybe about the, uh, the discourse, the political discourse that's come out of the uh, awakening, the uh, Islamic awakening, right, that may actually be saying things that cannot be recognized by us as belonging to either the 17th century or, you know, I, I like to call um, the um, Islamic uh, revolution is the last of the great revolutions in the French tradition. I say this for Joan Scott because, after all, uh, you know, where else do you have uh, uh, a reign of virtue, uh, people beheaded in the public square? <laughs> I mean, it has a lot of the, the, uh, the, the moments of... Uh, 
uh, with which we are familiar from the past. So I think that may be the last great past revolution in, in the uh, French tradition. Uh, but what we may be looking at here, or what might make us less afraid or more, more engaged with the other, supposed other, is what may be possible here um, that we're not up to. What may be new on the scene, whether it be in the, under the rubric democracy or under the rubric uh, of uh, conviviality, uh, that m may make it unnecessary to say we're still trying to figure out how we in the West can be less Western-centric. Mm -hmm. um, I never really know what is new, <laughs> um, but it is. But I do think, and when I when I wrote this book, I tried to structure it so that I would pull in things from the Muslim tradition, or Muslim discourse. And, um, and so I know the things that, that are, are new, or perhaps I should just say especially evocative to me. And, um, and one of them is the idea of human dignity. Now, human, I'm not going to claim that Islam talks about human dignity more or, more, or in a novel way, but, the, but I will say that, that it seemed to me that the the contemporary Muslim philosophers that I read talked about human dignity and especially economic dignity in a way that I found more effective and more moving than their um, Anglo-American contemporaries. So one of the things that I do do, and it is a little bit mischievous um, in the chapter on equality, is I counterpose Rawls to Syed Qutb. Now, it's a little mischievous because I'm using Syed Qutb's social justice in Islam and not signposts along the way, but it's just as, has went into just as many editions and is just as well circulated, and in part because I want to take someone who is regarded as a terrifying person and point out how very attractive his ideas about economic dignity are and how illuminating they are. And I do find that that, that theme runs through much of contemporary Muslim philosophic work, both, you know, fairly popular in, and, um, and, what do you say, more high literature. The other part that I find very evocative um, is the idea of bearing witness. And I think that the, I mean, for me, the, the um, what's interesting about or what was new to me about Muslim ideas of bearing witness was the extent to which it was formed as a daily public practice. That is to say, the way in which the call to prayer incorporates a call to bear witness. And, I mean, one could, it seemed to me that it democratized it and made it public while preserving the same sense of that, of that, uh, idea of bearing witness that I had found attractive in people like Levinas and Derrida. So I won't say it's new, but I think that many people will find things that, is, that are evocative or resonant or more sharply, uh, that speak to them more sharply in the Muslim tradition as in, indeed one, one might in any other tradition. It doesn't sound like it is. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, um, not from your talk, but when you were responding to, I think, the person who asked about Japanese Americans and Native Americans, or sometimes people call themselves American Indians. I mean, you, you mentioned that, we, that the, the West has kind of regret after the fact, and I believe you said that the regret, the regret is often taken to be some kind of compensation. And I was just wondering about this form of regret. Um, I was on Sunday with a group of indigenous people on 59th Columbus Circle, and they were, they were celebrating, well, they were commemorating their ancestors, but they were also protesting the, this, the thing that's being built, the installation for Columbus that's right on the circle. Um, it's built, being built by a Japanese artist, and at one point, you had various people speak. 
And one one man, you know, he said, you know, this is a Japanese artist. And he said, you know, he said to, as though he was speaking to the Japanese artist, he said, we don't, meaning Native Americans, he didn't mean uh, United States, I don't know. He said, we do not commemorate Hiroshima. And so I want to know what other people spoke. Let me just say a little bit more. Other people spoke. One woman, for example, um, she's living on what's sometimes called Indian Territory in Nevada. They are coming to her now. The, that is to say the United States. I believe Senator McCain approached them. They now want to take their water because they want to pump and fuel um, Las Vegas with the water. That these, that these, so the land had, it, it, as we know through these various treaties, um, Native Americans are always being taken off land. As soon as they find something valuable, they move them somewhere else. Then if they can find the resources and they take it away from them. So I, I just want to know what regret could possibly mean with not only the history in the sense of the past, but the history in the present. Um, how, what, is, what does it mean to acknowledge that you regret something when in fact you're continuing to do it, you compound it, and you don't, you steal wealth, and you don't make any kind of real compensation except to continue stealing. What could regret mean? Well, this is going to be a very curmudgeonly response. Um, but I think I, I am entirely in accord with your sense that regret is not adequate. And I'm continually struck by the willingness of people, and this is the curmudgeonly bit, especially my students, um, to say things like, I feel really bad for the people in the Sudan or someone should intervene in Darfur. And I think, well, what about you? <laughs> I mean, there, were, there was a time when people thought they ought to put their money where their mouth was in these things. You know, that if you, sh that if you thought something should be done, you joined the Abraham Lincoln Brigade or something of that nature. That if you thought that there was a particular fight that needed to be fought in Spain, you went and you fought it. But I'm troubled by this this these expressions of sentiment. It's so sad that people are suffering. By the way, let's send our military comprised of the less wealthy people to go and die. And that, I think, so I, I'm, it's not only that I have a kind of, which we see, ethical distaste for the exchange of sentiment for actual compensation or for stopping what you were doing that's wrong. But it's also because I think that that sentiment, that substitution of sentiment for action leads to other people being asked to do things which they did not choose and which it's not right to ask of them. So I don't think it's appropriate for my young students to do, say as they do, we should intervene in Darfur. And, I, and when I say to them, well, would you like to go? They say, of course not. And I say, well, you're asking someone else to go and die in your place then. And that seems to come as a surprise to them. But that, and it is that, so it's not just that it's bad that people regret things and don't stop doing them, but often that sentiment of regret leads to the, um, leads to the construction of an ethical imperative for interventions that people are not willing themselves to pay the price for. But my question really was, is there regret? I mean, I don't, I don't know, um, I'm not asking Mm -hmm. I'm asking on the basis of what does one even say that there's evidence for regret in the first place? Since, as you know, as you, as you know just saying, I'm sorry, it can't be it. But if, you were, mm -hmm. if one is continuing, if there's a nation that continues to undermine a group of people, commemorating symbols that brought it down, killed its people, and decimated it, what, what does it even mean in the first place to say that there is regret? What is the evidence that there is that particular sentence? It's it's a common American displacement. I'm sure it's not peculiar to Americans, but it's very common. Um, I mean, one of the things I think is fascinating about the United States is the extent to which um, Americans, especially Americans in the Northeast, are willing to sort of be shocked at a display of the Confederate flag or to be, you know, uh, dismissive or contemptuous of the South. And what I find shocking about this is, is it seems to me to entail the idea that, that that was then and there. It's not here and now. And racism is not something that existed in the Confederacy and was beaten by the Union. 
It's not something that somehow had some isolated presence in the American South and in the past. It's something which is here and now. And so that, that tendency, I think, to, to regret a past fault is allied to a tendency to deny it in the present. And I think that may be what you're seeing there. It's easy to regret something bad that happened in the past because you don't have to take responsibility for it in the present. So it is not surprising to find those things allied together sometimes. No, I was going to say just that. Okay. <laughs> Since I have the mic, I, um, I'm going... Um, uh, I'm, I was going to... Um, just follow back on follow up on Susan's uh, question about uh, sort of limitation of historical parallelism. You asked the question of uh, Jewish uh, on the Jewish question on the Muslim question, and I am just thinking about what is new. The question about what is new about the Muslim question, and not so much what the Muslims offer or Islamic resurgence offer as a, uh, in the discourse, but what is the new challenge for the West in terms of Muslim question that is not there, say, in the Jewish question. And, and I think one of the uh, response would be that, in some way, the Muslim question's fundamentally challenges uh, Western self-identity, is a sort of existential identity even. And, and my question is that, is there a way we can answer the Muslim question without jeopardizing our self-identity without uh, giving up fundamentally on some notions of modernity, some notions of progress, uh, and, and, and throwing the whole things out. And I, I think that may be something different. And that's why maybe uh, the responses to the Muslim question is that much more violent and maybe I'm not, I'm this, uh, okay, I'll stop there. Uh, well, I just want, and I just want you to talk about in the book when you talk about the fact that, that there's that amazing quote where you say that one hatred is, trans, is, is substituted for another, but that it doesn't mean we love the Jews. I mean, re- remember, I, I think you need, that's, that's at least part of the response I would give to this question. That is that it's, it, there's, there's more than a, a, an analogy at stake in the title of this book um, on the Muslim question with the resonance to on the Jewish question which has to do with the, the ways in which um, Islamophobia is a displacement of anti-Semitism. But you, Except that it just gets layered on top. That's, that's good. Yes. And the horrible, like the horrible pig soup woman. Do you know the pig soup woman? Well, there is a, there is a woman. I mean, I don't know in, if she's still France. working in, in Paris, in France. Actually, maybe not in, in Paris. Paris. Maybe no, she's in Paris. Uh, I think her name is Odile Bonneval. Is that her? Anyway. And she makes soup out of pork. She makes pork soup. And she makes pork soup so that Muslims and Jews won't eat it. Well, she brings it to a church. And she serves it publicly. She serves it to Have a welfare soup. recipient. Have some soup. But of course, oh. not everybody gets the soup. And it's, you know, it, I, the thing that's fascinating about it is it's just so bald. I mean, there's nothing about, you know, she, could get, she gets to hate twice with one bowl of soup. And <laughs> It's, it is, it's really quite revealing. And I think that, that, that you get that layering of hatreds that, I mean, I have nothing particularly illuminating to say about a disposition that I do see in certain circles. And why should I not name them? People like Debbie Schlussel or Pamela Geller, they're just running around looking for someone to hate. Um, and it's and they really do want someone to hate, and they clearly enjoy it at a certain level. And I found these I find these people incredibly dispiriting. I mean, what, how can you answer them? What can you say to them? Um, but that disposition is profound, it, it, in the sense that it's deep and enduring. And there does appear to be this, and it's sort of looking for an object. And how it selects its objects, I don't know, except that I think much of that work is done, you know, by external sources. You, it's safer to hate Muslims than it is to hate Jews. Or it's safer to hate African Americans than it is to hate um, Italian Americans or something. It's not, there's no deep content to it. But at, at a given moment, there's a preferred object of hate. This is not, I, I claim, this, this is, I think, really a very vulgar account, but I think it might be a vulgar thing. 
Toby, why don't you pass it to, um, I think there was a question there in the middle, or, to Gil. or to Adam. Gil. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so I understand that, you know, part of what you want to do is kind of make us comfortable with the otherness of terrorism. So, you know, this is a, a quotidian aspect of our life or something like that. But then part of what you want to do also is de-otherize it to a certain extent. You know, say terrorism is something that we do too. You know, it's associated with our identity. And the Cromwell example is very good with that because, you know, here's someone who we ideologically relate to, but, you know, who's used these means in the past, uh, the tactic of terror or whatever. But what the Cromwell example doesn't really do is de-otherize the ideology that, we think usually stands behind, you know, Muslim terror, which is this kind of intensely anti-democratic, anti-egalitarian, uh, theocratic ideology. And that's something that, that, that really scares us. Uh, and so I wonder if you want, even want to say anything about what in the book or, or in the talk about how, you know, that, that ideology is something, you know, we should regard as less other than, than we do. I don't know if you want to so, I mean, you could say some things like, you know, this is a really extreme ideology. In fact, most Muslims, you know, it's very marginal, this kind of extreme ideology. You could, you could say that, and that, or you could say that, you know, we, too, in the West have intensely anti-democratic, very extremist ideologues as well. Uh, so that's one question I had. Another, another quick comment that, that I just wanted to make was that I always you associate courage with fearlessness, but I remember from reading Plato and Socrates, you know, when I was an undergrad, Socrates always says, you know, you're courageous if you fear. It's precisely when you fear. So every time you'd say that, you know, that kind of came to mind. Um, I, I mean, I could say that, and I think it's true. I don't think, you know, most, I don't think, well, it's obvious that most Muslims aren't extremists. Um, are we scared of theocrats? I'm not sure I'm scared of theocrats. Um, I mean, I don't want to live in a theocracy. On the other hand, I was raised until she, like, a couple years ago when she lost her faith at the age of 82. Um, I was raised by an extremely devout Catholic. And I'm not sure that's all that different. So it does, I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't make me shake in my boots. Um, although I, as I said, I don't want to live under it. Uh, but I, um, I am interested in what scares us, and I'm interested in what scares us for the kind of reason, reason you suggested at the end, because I do think we need to, to face fear, I, and I, because I think these are all quite rational fears. I think it's perfectly reasonable to fear that somebody might blow you up, but in a certain sense, it's a problem. It's, an, it's a rational fear, which must be irrationally suppressed if we are going if we are going to do democracy. Because it is really rational for me to know that I really can't be sure that you're all safe. It would, I have no way of knowing that. I don't know where you came from. I don't know what you've got in your bag. It's really, it would be rational for me to be suspicious. <coughs> but I can't, we can't afford that particular rationality. We have to have daring in its place. And so I do want to cultivate that daring, and I want to cultivate that daring at the risk of rationality. Um, I'm not, I would argue that ultimately it is the, in the service of rationality, but I think it is, in, in the immediate sense, it's an irrational move that we, that we should make. It's an irrational act of faith. There was a question over there, Adam, if you want to pass it. Yeah, to Gil. Thank you. My name is Mujahid Biliji, and uh, in your uh, responses, you said that you lived in Southeast Asia. Is your middle name Hussein? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. it is not. That, that was the humor part. Let's move to okay. the fear part, which are interrelated stuff. The, the figure of terrorist is uh, very interesting. I myself work on American Islam and perception of Muslims, and at the airport, when Muslim person enters the airport, all this, you know, uh, awareness and call for reporting and so on, uh, highlight the existence of Muslim as a kind of threat, source of anxiety and so on. It seems like increasingly arresting Muslim as a source of unpredictability and threat is becoming more refined and more existential. Now, there's a focus on the face of the terrorist. 
that because space is the site of transcendence and indeterminacy. So there are efforts at you know trying to understand the expression intention behind facial expressions and so on. So uh, now going back to your. Uh, here is my question. Does terrorism infuse grace into our lives by reminding us our groundlessness in the world, in a sense, restores our authenticity as human beings? And um, so that's the first question. second one is it's exclusively political theory question. In liberal democracy, private sphere remains the site of terrorism I think. Uh, constitu- in the constitutive moment, there is violence, and then it disappears, but it is preserved in the private sphere. How would you respond to that? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand it. Um, when you say it, it, it's preserved in the private sphere, what do you mean? Well, public sphere is defined by a law and rule, and private sphere is the sphere where the subject is free to subject violence upon himself or herself care of the self is a form of terror and violence, if you will. This way is not blocked when it is private. But, but don't you think that, that some, of the, um, some of the representation of um, terror associated with Muslims is precisely because the private public is... Um, transgress because it's a religion that's a public religion, for example, that insists on um, displaying its, its um, commitments and beliefs in, in visibly public ways. It's not a Protestant private religion. I mean, I know you're, you're, you're saying yeah. something else, but it seems to me that the public private in that sense is that the, the private sphere or the, that line is being um, blurred or obliterated yeah. by um, what Islam is taken to, to represent. Yeah, I think that the terrorist is a loose uh, uh, spark of sovereignty that hasn't been incorporated into the structure that produces public and private. Therefore, it appears violent as terrorist. Mm-hmm. But, you know, normally every human being is a terrorist. When we eat food, when we serve the army, you know, there is violence everywhere. But it has been organized and it flows in the direction of the law and police, for example. Uh, it doesn't appear as violence to us. So the otherness, the violence of the other, always appears as violent and violating. So we perceive it as violence. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I tend to think that in private sphere, individual is allowed to play with this capacity for violence, the creativity. And uh, it's often, you know, playfulness, torture, whatever you call it. That is extremely interesting, and I must say I like this idea of the loose spark of sovereignty and the way in which these capacities might be channeled, but I would have to think about that a lot, and I will. Um, but I, 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 you said something about the airport, and I'm quite interested in the airport. And I will send you my book. There is a whole section on this. So. <laughs> Do I love the airport, and I think about the airport all the time because I think the airport is a, re- is a reenactment of something that happened, of a, of a classic colonial... Um, activity, which is that, you know, the colonizer went to the colonies and developed a technique of of surveillance or control, and then that technique migrates back to the metropole. And I think that's what we see in the, in the air, the activities in the airport are all aimed at the terrorists, but it's everybody, everybody's taking their shoes off and thanking the people at the, at the cameras so that that apparatus of control actually spreads out through the whole thing. Exactly, and there's so many examples one could think of. So, yes, I do appreciate that. There is a question, too. Yes, that's Why don't you hand the mic? Um, thank you. Um, I, I really liked the moment when you said, um, you know, why, why uh, should I be Western? Why? Um, and um, you, you began by saying this is a book about us. Um, and I take it that... Um, when we think about ourselves, um, we, we think of ourselves as um, liberals. Liberalism, you didn't say maybe we shouldn't think of ourselves as liberals. You said we shouldn't think of ourselves as Westerners. Uh, so my question, uh, short question would be, uh, is it in fact the case that uh, one can distinguish between the two? Um, in other words, shouldn't we say 
after hearing you, uh, we are not liberals by uh, any means. In other, uh, not, not in the sense that we should call ourselves something else, but in the sense that whatever it is that we think about ourselves, not just by way of a name, but is not at all what we think. Yes, we're wrong about ourselves. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that uh, you were asked to distinguish between Muslims uh, when you said the object of my inquiry is ourselves. Um, and I'm not a political theorist, but I'm under the impression that the subject of liberalism is not the subject of fear. Um, I seem to remember uh, Schmidt saying that if someone is not a pessimist, um, uh, one is not thinking politically. Uh, if one doesn't have a dark vision of human nature, one is not thinking politically. But I'm under the impression that the liberal tradition is not really in agreement with that particular um, uh, assessment. Hobbes is not the theorist of choice for, uh, again, I'm not a political theorist, but I'm under the impression that Hobbes is not the political, the political philosopher of choice to think uh, a liberalism. And if he were um, uh, invoked, it would probably be for, uh, 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 in order to ask ourselves whether fear, when man is a wolf for man, to quote that ancient saying that uh, uh, Hobbes deploys, um, whether one would want to distinguish between the fear that one experiences as a result of one's own violence projected onto others and, sh and shared, or whether fear is not, as I think is the case in Hobbes, correct me if I'm wrong, um, an instrument of rule, that one needs to, in fact, uh, uh, sovereignty, needs to enact, in fact, all, yes, it needs to embody all. Uh, Carlo Ginzburg is, has been working on this uh, lately, and I think it, it, what he's doing is very, inter very interesting in the sense that fear is an instrument of rule, not so much some, uh, um, some emotion or affect that one would be feeling at a particular topic, namely Muslim theocrats. Um, you know, the culture of fear and all this. Uh, um, it, it, there's, in fact, a kind of discipline. You were speaking of the airport. One is taught to be afraid of the shoes of one's neighbor, after all, by way of a very strict disciplinary apparatus. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, are we, uh, are we liberals if we have become subjects of fear? Not only insofar as we experience fear at all kinds of things, avian flu, and, uh, but not nuclear, um, um, not the nuclear industry and not um, drones, even though they are flying in all kinds of ways above our cities. Um, but we are afraid uh, of specific things. We seem to be disciplined in a particular way. That doesn't strike me as liberal. And I'm struck by the fact, much as in with French laïcité, yes, or with French republicanism, one, French republicanism is not called upon to transform itself. It thinks of itself correctly. The question is whether Muslims can or cannot change. And insofar as there is, I think, more, and I'm grateful that John was pointing out that there's more than some consequential argument to be made between the Jewish question and the Muslim question, as you know. Um, the question is if those questions are still being asked about others and whether they can or cannot integrate, doesn't that suggest that the educational project of liberalism, of democracy, the changing subject, the free subject, uh, in its educational capacity of the West or, or of liberalism is not, in fact, what it thinks it is. It is not so capable of change. Uh, it seems to exceed its own uh, history. Uh, it doesn't, it's not born in the 16th or 17th century. It seems to be born a little earlier. It may have uh, genealogical roots that are more expensive than liberalism, and it seems to be uh, so strangely incapable of change in the face of those questions. Are we what we say we are? I'm not, I, I, I share a set of anxieties with you, but I would almost put them in the opposite way. That my fear is that not that liberalism doesn't change, but that it changes too much. That um, that the the liberal, certain, the liberal protections and imperatives that once seemed so closely allied to democracy now seem to replace it. And it increasingly seems to me that in liberal democracy, liberalism operates like the Derridian supplement. It adds only to replace. So that we become more and more anxious about democracy. You said you're not interested in the new. That would be it would the be the of liberalism as constantly new. 
It's constantly new. I don't know how new it is. But I do, I worry about this sense. I think liberalism has come to cultivate fear. And let me give you a non-Muslim example. Um, for example, I think that I think that queer people are taught, fear your fellow citizens. Go to the courts. For God's sake, don't go to the legislature. Don't do democratic politics. That would be dangerous. Go to the courts. And, in, and we're continually presented with the idea that courts are safer than legislatures and that you should, you should, not, you should not, you know, go into the public sphere and battle for, for something or claim your rights or fight for your rights. You should, you should rely on the state to give them to you. And that, I think that liberalism, or liberal, I think that, liberal institutions, as we know them now, seem to be cultivating that fear in people. And that disposition to fear um, is a, be, has become a counterweight to democracy. And so that's why I'm interested in, in, um, in fearlessness. So I'm not sure if I would say, I'm not sure, I, I sometimes think we're, in some respects, too liberal, too fearful, too um, too interested in legal guarantees, um, too unwilling to put the to go to the democratic part of the liberal democratic, um, and in those senses, I think we are liberal. I'm not so sure that we're liberal, and this may be this may be where what you're referring to. I'm not so sure we're liberal in the sense that we still believe in or. Um, in those in in rights, and in that sense, I really am a liberal. I really like rights. I would like to make more. I want as many rights as possible, um, and I like that expanding notion of rights. So um, that in, that part of liberalism seems to have gone and been replaced by the fearful bit. Marx did say that security was the uh, um, one of the founding arguments of the subject he was looking at. I don't think he was speaking of the liberal subject necessarily. But security seems to have some other uh, um, genealogy. In other words, it's not, uh, uh, to invoke the term new, it doesn't seem to be new. It seems to exceed whatever liberalism thinks about itself. Um, it's not something that happened on September 11. We didn't start developing a security apparatus and a military state in 2001. So there's a question in the front. Yeah. Where's the mic, anyway? Right, right, right in front of me. Hi, uh, David. Um, I'd like to. I have a question, or maybe sort of a criticism regarding fear, specifically your notion that you know our fear of the terrorist is a rational fear that anyone could kill us. And it's certainly true that anyone in this room could be carrying a bomb. But it's also true, I think, that we are far more likely to die of car crashes or diseases or other natural occurrences, or even at the hands of someone we know than of a stranger. I think it takes a certain amount of courage just to basically get out of the bed in the morning and live a life at all. I'm not sure if the courage it takes to live in a democratic society, as you put it, is really of a much different kind than the regular kind of courage it takes just to live a life. So I was wondering what your thoughts about that are. Mm -hmm. I do think it's harder. I mean, I agree with you. It's hard to get out of bed in the morning. And for very, for very good reasons. The world is a really difficult place. And... Um, it is very hard for people to live in the world. And that, um, that does require something of people and something that we don't very often recognize. But I think it's even harder to live democratically because all the guarantees you're kind of offered, like the state will take care of you or the law will take care of you, they're not, they're not there in the same way. You're, something is demanded of you. Go do it yourself. And I, I think that demand is, is important. I think it's very difficult. I think it is, um, I think it is harder than getting out of bed in the morning. And I think it is, it is partly why Hobbes goes to an autocratic sovereign. Because there's something that that in that old imperative to security, that is a very that is a very powerful imperative, and it is an imperative that inhabits our inhabits the world before liberalism does. So it it is in that sense older. 
and it still has a certain fearful power. And I would like to see that um, countered. Of in you know in the past I've been a critic of Hannah Arendt, and I still hold by by the, by reasons for for those criticisms. But I am increasingly struck by the power of her emphasis on uh, what is it? Uh, you know, sisters do it it for themselves, or something. That you should that that the imperative to participate, the imperative to live a democratic life, to live a political life, and um, and that I think is a di- is a more difficult imperative than getting out of bed in the morning, and. Not in any way to diminish that. I do think the difficulty of life is something that we, we should acknowledge. We have two more questions, and then we'll give them a break. Um, in the in the back, and then on the, and why don't you state your name, if you don't mind? I'm Lydia Wilson, and um, yeah, I have a slightly different question. I'm interested in your choice of quote to open the book, which is by Al Farabi. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to um, declare my interest here. My doctorate was on Al Farabi. Um, and medieval Islamic political philosophy. And at the moment, I'm looking at how people are drawing on the history of their philosophy, either classical or medieval, to bolster claims of authority or to define identity through um, religion or political groups and so on. And you, s- you started with characterising your book as about the West, um, as Orientalism is. And... I wondered what you think that quote is doing on your behalf um, to an audience, either a Western audience, um, a non-Muslim audience or a Muslim audience. Like, what kind of authority are you claiming from Al-Farabi and how do you think that's going across, getting, getting something across to your diverse audiences? Mm-hmm. It's making my West. That is to say, I mean, I was, uh, I was a student of Fasla Rahman. And so this is as much a part of my education as Hobbes was. Um, I mean, just in sort of practical terms. And so I'm drawing on that education as a Westerner. I had it at Chicago. Um, And it's also a particularly apt quote for that purpose because it's a quote in which Al-Farabi takes something of Plato and changes it, and he changes it in a more democratic direction. So it is, um, it both evokes that classical democratic genealogy for the West, but it shows that it has another expression, and also that expression comes, it doesn't just, it doesn't just go to Baghdad, it goes to Chicago, and it's that circulation that I want to capture and that constitution of a different of, of a different West, a West that is a little more capacious, in which you can read Al-Farabi. And I would like, I mean, because it is circulating, I would like it that if, you know, if, um, if it is the case that Muslims outside the West were to read this book, that they would say that they had something in common with me. Um, I would like that. Um, and I want to mark that. One last question. Thank you. Uh, Hamid Sebri, uh, thank you very much, Anne. I, I appreciate your uh, presentation as well as the uh, tremendously important educational uh, route that you've taken in Asia as well as uh, in the Middle East and your studies in Chicago. Um, I took some notes about uh, from, on a number of important questions that that you raised. For example, how would it be to think of Protestant ethic in the spirit of Islam? Uh, you also raised another important question, such as today's Muslims' questions is yesterday's Jewish question, and. Um, and, and, and also, what is a Westerner? Uh, these are all very important questions to me. Uh, I think, though, 
While all these questions make me think very hard about the essence of what you are trying to convey, on the other hand, it con- they concern me about another question, and that is, what constitutes a Muslim? Uh, in the same manner that you raised the question as to what is a Westerner, which is a very important question, one can also raise the question as to what is a Muslim. Uh, a Muslim is not only Sayyid Qutb. A Muslim is not only uh, Fazlur Rahman. Uh, a Muslim is not only Ayatollah Khomeini. There are many, many different kinds of Muslim. As a matter of fact, one can say there is only one Islam and many different Muslims. So, uh, so I think the whole idea of what constitutes a Muslim need to be discussed and elaborated. Um, That's number uh, one idea that I had in mind. And the other um, idea is the other side of the coin. You you raised the question as to the fear, the fear of Muslims. On the other hand, one can also, a Muslim in the United States can raise the fear of, of the Westerner or an American. I, as a person born into a Shia family, having lived in the United States for many, many, many years and having worked and taught in the United States, still experience this when I'm sitting at the tea, at the subway, or on the streets reading anything which has to do with Islam. And I experienced that fear myself. So um, I think it would perhaps make it a lot more clear if you turned it around a little bit and also looked at the other side of the coin. The, the other side of the coin being? In terms of, uh, in terms of the fear, the fear of, of Muslim terrorism. Which I also think this, this, is, this is an idea that not many people necessarily think of. This is an idea which has been inculcated into some of our heads by, by the ruling elements of our societies. Mm-hmm. So um, we also need to think about how Muslims may also fear the idea of the West, of Westerners. I guess that's what I meant. Am yes. I clear? No, I think so. And um, and yes, I would. I would. Ag- I would ag- certainly agree with you that this is not the only fear, and it does have its mirroring image- images in the fear of the West. I'm most interested in what you said, though, along the way, which was this: um, you know, that there are many Muslims, and there are many ways of being a Muslim, and this. Uh, um, in my, ha- in my happy ending part of the book, I, I take this up a little bit because I do think it is the sort of sheer inventiveness of human beings is quite remarkable. And these categories that people inhabit, like Muslim or Westerner, they, you know, they, have a, they have a kind of shrinking quality. When people are actually doing these, being these things, they do them in all sorts of ways that other people don't recognize. And, it, and of course, they fight about it. You know, are you a good Muslim? Are you a bad Muslim? Are you a, you know, an, or you know, good Catholic, bad Catholic, good Jew, bad Jew, reform, conservative, reconstructionist, all these things that you could be. And they're wildly inventive. So that you got, you, do you know that, that novel called The Taqwa Corps? I mean, it's full of very transgressive kinds of Muslims. And that's just fascinating. That people can think of all these different ways to be something. That, I think, is, that is newness entering the world. And although I understand the impulse to regulate it, and indeed the, the, the identities that I hold, like I do think of myself as an American, and there are many people who I think, who I would say, that is a bad American. Um, 
And I would argue with them, and I would want to, you know, I would want to dispute with them about this. I really want to hit them upside of the head. Um, but I would repress this desire. And so I understand that impulse to regulate it, but at the same time, part of you has to stand back and look at those really horrible and weird Americans and say, it's really, look at the capacity of human inventiveness. How many ways they can find to be something, to be Muslim, to be American. And um, it is why I like that Al-Farabi quote, too, because it points to that extraordinary capacity for inventiveness and for bringing in the new that has both great dangers and also, but also great promise. And I think we need to risk the dangers to get the promise. Okay. Do you um, want to wrap anything up? No, it's a perfect way to end. Okay, well, thank you very much, Annie. <laughs>